So I think we should talk about the 1KZTE overheating. Um, this video isn't just for the 1KZTE. I'm going to close this because it's raining. Okay, it's not just for the 1KZTE. It's really for any Toyota turbo diesel that seems to get warm or warmer than it should do going up hills. Um, I get a lot of questions about this, like I'm some sort of expert or guru or something. I just make, you know, a couple of YouTube videos on stuff that I know. Because people ask me so often about their 1KZTE high ace vans, or even um, the Hilux Surf, which is the JDM version of the Toyota 4Runner, uh, people ask me about those getting warm, and it's always um, two scenarios where this sort of thing happens. The first one is sitting in traffic. Um, so you're bumper to bumper traffic, and the engine starts to get a little bit warm. Uh, the second one, is when you're climbing hills, um, long steep hills is the one that causes the issues. So it's not just um, it's not just going up little sort of mounds or little hills. It's the long steep ones, uh, particularly on hot days. But for some people, it's um, even on cool days. The first thing we need to discuss is overheating in general. Um, having your temperature gauge come up to three quarters of the way is not actually overheating. Sure, it's warmer than we'd like it to be. Um, but contrary to popular belief, the 1KZTE engine's heads, or cylinder head, uh, is not made of glass. Um, it will not crack if you go to three quarters of the way up on the temperature gauge. But bear in mind, I have a whole lot of other things to say about that. Don't take my word for it just yet. The reason these engines have such a bad rep for cracking cylinder heads um, comes down to a couple of things that I figured out over time. The first one we need to talk about is the two types of overheating that people are experiencing. Uh, the first one being sitting in bumper to bumper traffic. To be honest, if your car is sitting uh, in bumper to bumper traffic and the temperature gauge is climbing beyond halfway, um, you have some underlying issues. Uh, I know from experience that these cars, regardless if it's the Hilux Surf, uh, a Land Cruiser 80 or 100 series, um, or in this instance, a High Ace, uh, I know that they should not be overheating or getting warm regardless of the ambient temperature while sitting in traffic. The cooling system should be more than adequate to keep the engine cool, even at something like 44 degrees Celsius with the air conditioning running and bumper to bumper so the car in front of you um, has the hot exhaust blowing right into your radiator intake. Uh, it still should be able to cope with that with ease. So, so um, if that's happening to you, uh, some of these things that I'm about to say might apply to you, but really you should be looking at um, every sort of component in your cooling system and figuring out what's failed and what's not doing its job properly. I'm sorry, every time I, every time you see me move around, I'm finding like little bits of fabric or something like, in this instance, bright blue fabric on my velour seats. And I seem to find something every time I sit back here, which is not often that I'm here. Okay, so there are a few things that we need to cover with the high S overheating going up hills. Um, cars going up hills, these cars from this era, like the High Ace uh, Super Custom, the uh, Hilux Surf, the 80 Series Land Cruiser, particularly the VX models uh, out of Japan, um, all of them uh, did not have the level of R&D and uh, I guess the the broad spectrum in operation um, built into them from factory, unless uh, it was sold in a particular market. So. I've said before um, how this car, the highest Super, uh, has survived in the Pacific Islands. Um, it survived in Japan, obviously, where it was built for. Um, and they have really hilly, mountainous terrain. And these cars have survived for two decades um, plus, counting, with basic maintenance. And they don't overheat. The cylinder heads don't crack. Uh, it's only when it seems to come to places like Australia and America, uh, Canada even, even in England, uh, funnily enough, where they start to have issues with cooling. And I said that these cars are perfectly fine, and I wasn't kidding, they, they are perfectly fine here. It's just that um, when you think about where these cars were sold to and what they were designed to do, um, they didn't need the additional cooling that we do here in Australia. So compare it to a VX Limited Land Cruiser 80 Series uh, JDM example for Japan which we got in New Zealand as well and we never had issues with them towing nothing um, but you bring a VX Limited into Australia 
and the temperature gauge will start to climb going up hills, especially if you're towing. Uh, in a lot of cases, even when you're not towing, even when you've only got two people in the car, um, and people start to think, oh, well, these JDM imports are, are crap. Um, and you compare that to the Australian models, there are differences. So the Japanese know when they design a car for a particular market that there are certain changes that they have to make to that car to make sure that it can survive with the environment that it's being sold into. Uh, an Australian 80 series Land Cruiser, um, besides having standard dual fuel tanks versus the single tank sold in uh, Japanese models, um, also has a couple of differences. So if we're just talking about cooling, I'll tell you one other difference, which is the spare wheel carrier. Most of the Japanese 80 series Land Cruisers have their spare wheel on the back, um, on the tailgate, on a swing away carrier. But every single 80 series sold in Australia had its spare wheel. In fact, every single Land Cruiser in Australia has its spare wheel um, slung underneath the car. And that's because if that car was to go on the outback roads that we have here with those little wash away corrugations, uh, that spare wheel carrier can uh, develop metal fatigue and just fall off. So they mount the spare wheels underneath on these really sturdy sort of uh, cable winches that hold it in place. Um, and the other difference with uh, cars in Australia, um, and the same as America, is cooling. Uh, the radiators are usually almost always much bigger uh, in Australia than it would be in Japan. If we were to tie this back, even though Japan and uh, places like Fiji and stuff are really mountainous, have super steep hills, uh, the speeds and the roads driving up those hills is very low and slow. So you would not do, speaking from ex experience in New Zealand, you would not be doing more than about 70 kilometers an hour climbing those hills um, on a good dry day. If it's wet and if it's a really steep hill, the roads are narrower, they're smaller, uh, and the bends are quite twisty. Chances are you'll be doing about 40 to 50 kilometers an hour, which is about 30 miles an hour. So not very fast at all. And that's what these cars are built to do. Uh, this high a Super is designed to climb hills at low speeds. Um, the wrong way to think about it and what people get into trouble with with these cars is thinking and I guess I see where you're coming from uh, it's getting warm climbing up this really long steep hill in Australia I'm gonna put my foot down more increase the RPM more and uh, the water pump should be spinning the water around much faster that way it'll cool the water more and things will be better uh, only to find that it increases the temperature by which point your cylinder head is cracked that is not the way to do it. Um, when you do put your foot down more, you're asking the engine to burn much more diesel. Uh, the turbocharger is working harder. A lot of these cars didn't have the factory intercooler like this one. Um, so that, you know, hot air from outside on a hot day, uh, plus the turbo compressing that, it's burning it, the exhaust is hot, the radiator is hot, everything's hot, and you cook the engine. The best thing to do uh, to drive these things is to back off the accelerator you need to come down to about 70 kilometers an hour and then turn off the overdrive check out this perfect water beam by the way i have to i i gotta show you that is the turtle wax ceramic coating after like five months now i made a video on this car uh a high ace update video um a little while ago where i said that bumper to bumper traffic it was 40 degrees celsius it didn't overheat we went to the beach went up north Drove it a lot on a really hot day, and it was fine. Uh, after that, I recently drove this 800 kilometers, I think it's about 500 miles, um, down south on a scorching hot day uh, into a forest. It did the forest and the four-wheel driving stuff easy, uh, but there were some really long, steep hills where the temperature gauge went from half, where it always sits, and it started climbing and climbing and climbing, and it got to just under three quarters on the, on the needle. I've read a few owner's manuals that have been translated from Japanese um, when I was younger and this is the era car that I grew up with and so it applies to this car as well and the designers, the engineers that wrote that manual, the um, operating manual for these cars knew that sometimes the temp gauge will go above half, uh, up to three quarters of the way. They give you some techniques on how to drive it, they say reduce your speed uh, and drive the car normally until the temperature gauge comes back down to normal. The wrong thing to do in those situations is to quickly pull over and shut the engine off uh, because then 
you're no longer having coolant circulate so that super hot coolant will start to get what's called engine soak or heat soak and it'll just sit in the engine and get hotter and hotter actually with the engine off the best thing to do is just to drive the car normally um, slow your speed down take the overdrive off in this car for example it climbs hills at its most happiest when it's really hot and it's starting to climb to just back off the accelerator take the overdrive off and climb up at about 70 kilometers an hour which is third gear locked up on the torque converter i talk a lot about gears on this automatic um, and that's because there is a lot of options this car actually has seven forward ratios with the gearbox uh, even though it's a three speed with overdrive you have first gear second gear third gear third gear with a torque converter locked up you push the overdrive button on you get fourth gear which is actually fifth and then at 80 kilometers an hour the torque converter locks up uh, in fourth or fifth anyway you get your sixth ratio and um, it's happiest climbing hills doing about 70 kilometers an hour with the overdrive button off uh, the engine will surge for a second it'll go into third gear and basically scream uh, because it's quite high RPM at 70 kilometers an hour especially if you've just come off overdrive and so you'll be coming out of sixth gear uh, straight into third essentially but immediately um, it should then lock up the torque converter uh, so you'd have basically gear 3.5 or 4 and that's where it wants to climb hills on uh, sure you can't blast up hills at 110 kilometers an hour anymore you might piss some people off by slowing down a lot uh, but that's a trade-off that you're going to have to make you know do i climb this hill screaming at 110 kilometers an hour even 100 kilometers an hour uh, and risk blowing my cylinder head or cracking my engine uh, cylinder head or do i slow down and climb the hills as per how the car was designed so uh, the second thing uh, people talk about a lot on facebook mainly is every day there's about five cylinder heads that crack around the world that get posted about on the internet on these cars um, people drive them uh, they overheat and the cylinder heads crack and so these have built up the sort of reputation of being uh, built with glass heads you know you could probably hold a candle next next to it and you'd hear it crack that's all um it's wrong it's not how it is people have a massive distrust for the temperature gauge in these cars uh, they just don't trust the gauges they there's a lot of talk about how to resolve these issues um, I've done it from experience on not this car yet but I will do uh, but on Land Cruisers before and growing up surrounded by JDM cars Hilux surfs things like that you kind of learn a thing or two um, firstly it's driving it how you drive it um, you got to remember these cars uh, weren't designed for Australia uh, they weren't designed to go flat out up these long big we have big roads we have a big country uh, up these long big hills uh, for extended periods of time they're designed for city driving commuting um, maybe doing you know a maximum distance of about 400 kilometers uh, in between fuel stops things like that you know they weren't like crossing outback cars but they can be you know the the fundamentals the bones of the car um, the bones of these cars are here that they're, they're okay to as a starting point but you do have to do a couple of things to them to make them i guess aussie proof um yankee proof american proof uh to get them good for our roads and in different parts of the world here's what people tend to do they there's a lot of talk about a 71 degree thermostat let me tell you one thing if your car's overheating say uh, your temperature gauge is at three quarters of the way up uh, on the gauge climbing a big steep hill no matter what thermostat you put in whether it's a factory one or a 71 degree thermostat both are going to be massively wide open to their maximum amount of flow well before the car gets anywhere near to three quarters on that gauge so putting in the 71 degree thermostat might help you if your car's getting a bit warm sitting in traffic uh, but in terms of long steep hills it's not really going to help you a lot the argument there is people say yeah but it'll be open well before look it doesn't matter by then by the time you're halfway up or even less than halfway up the hill and your car's starting to heat up like this one did um, it doesn't matter what thermostat you have in there both are going to be wide open as part of a broader range of things to do to your car definitely it's good you know it's nice to have but then the danger is what about winter when it's really really cold 
um, and then it takes you half an hour to warm up properly. Like I said on another video of mine, um, this car will only allow the torque converter to lock up when the car is fully up to running temperature. And even on a warm day here, uh, sometimes that takes 15 minutes of driving on the motorway. Uh, with the turbo on boost, and after you know 15 minutes of being on the motorway, you have as it comes back in to uh, lock up that torque converter. So you start overcooling the car, um, it's going to take it, you know, a decade or so before it actually gets up to running temperature, and then you get your two extra gear ratios. So it can be detrimental to you uh, to overcool the car. The second thing people talk about a lot is putting in a 10 blade fan. Uh, to get more airflow flowing over the radiator or getting sucked through the radiator um, again as part of a broad range of things to do great if you just put in a 71 degree thermostat and a 10 bladed fan uh, you probably won't notice too much of a difference you've got to remember climbing these hills some of these hills are like two and a half kilometers long and you you start them at about 110 kilometers an hour at you know just 400 meters in your temp gauge starts to climb um, a lot of people say yeah just turn the heater on you know the heater trick does work to a certain degree but you shouldn't have to do that i didn't do it climbing the hills on this one that day i just drove it uh, i slowed down i turned the uh, overdrive off i climbed the hills at 75 by the time i was reaching the top of the hill uh the temp gauge started coming back down automatically and then i just drove normally and uh, it took about three minutes and the temp gauge slowly comes back down to normal um, obviously once you've passed the crest of the hill you can put the overdrive back on and just drive it normally. Uh, my temp gauge got to three quarters of the way up and there's a fine line here and it's it's scary to tread that line. Uh, in my experience, um, I'm not guaranteeing anything here, anything from uh, halfway on the gauge needle mark up to three quarters of the way should be fine on a 1KZTE. Proof in point, this car did it uh, about four or five times. It went to three quarters of the way up on the gauge for quite a significant period of time and then came back down and we've driven it well it's been about a month now all over the place the coolant's fine there's no oil there's no smoke head's still fine it hasn't cracked it's it's not made of glass in terms of uh driving issues those are the two sorts of heating type those are the two types of heating issues people have stuck in traffic or climbing hills mainly climbing hills is a big one uh, the solutions that people come up with on the internet 10 bladed fan 71 degree thermostat things like that um, there's a lot of people that put in uh, aftermarket transmission coolers, uh, which is great if you've got an automatic. That's, again, as part of a package of things to do, that's, that's a good thing. Um, obviously, there's a ton of people out there with aftermarket temperature gauges because no one relies on the Toyota gauge. I'm sure you've heard of it. Oh, well, you know, Toyota don't want people freaking out. So, so by the time, you know, they, they calibrate the gauge and it gets up to, oh, it's too late, mate, the engine's gone, kaput. So people are driving around with, like, you know, they, they put aftermarket fans on, electric fans, um, temperature gauges, and it's just stupid, you know. You put these fans on, they block um, airflow, which is needed, and then you're, you're sitting there, you know, panicking, watching your temp gauge like a hawk, watching that digital readout or whatever it is, telling you, oh my god, it's at 105 degrees Celsius. I'm under the impression, from experience, that Toyota engineers, most car engineers, knew what they were doing when they built a car. They did their R&D. There's a lot of work that has to go into building one of these things, designing it, testing it, stress testing it, um, to make sure that it can pass and be ready for production. They don't just build something without really testing it in hot environments, climbing hills, things like that, and then put it out. Did Toyota engineers design and calibrate the temperature sender uh, to show that the engine's overheating too late uh, by which point you've caused significant engine damage no they didn't the big issue there is with people not trusting the temp gauges comes down to one thing uh, especially on old cars like this one this one's 23 years old 24 almost 24 years old now um, and it's the same for old Land Cruisers it's the same for Hilux Surfs those temperature senders are old and I've said it before in another video Cars like this have sat in Japan for many, many years before they actually get sold. Uh, it could be a few months, it could be a few years before they, the family or the people that own them decide to sell them and then they make their way to the auctions, um, onto a boat and lands in your country somewhere in, in, in your hands. And also, 
we like to think of Japan as being this perfectly meticulous country that does everything uh, by the book to the T, uh, which just isn't the case. Uh, Japan, and with the risk of sounding um, stereotypical here, uh, Japanese people take a lot of pride in the appearance of their vehicles. Um, it's a status thing. And the mechanical side of things is just something that, pff, you, you know, you take it into the workshop once a year or so. Mechanics are losing common sense. The basics that they used to do back when you used to go get a service and they would rotate your tires, um, they would check the spare tire and inflate that, you know, things like that. Um, a lot of places aren't doing that anymore. Uh, you know, if I took this in, I, I can almost guarantee you, if I took this into any old mechanic here in Perth for a service, they wouldn't even check the diff oils. They do the engine oil and filter, they they look at, you know, the power steering fluid, brake fluid, yeah, it's there, yeah, it's there. Um, oh, put some water in the windscreen wash, it's done. You know, that level of checking and care is no longer there. So, long story short, like this car, the diff oils weren't done for about 10 years. Uh, the coolant doesn't get changed very often at all. Here in Australia, private owners like myself are quite uh, meticulous with changing fluids like that. Diff oils, coolant every two or three years, stuff like that. In Japan, it could go 10 years without getting a coolant flush. You know, 10 years is a long time for uh, a water to be sitting into a, in a cooling system. And uh, what happens is the temperature sender or the sensor uh, gets a thin layer of oxidation corrosion uh, or and it kind of basically varnishes itself and in my experience not just with this car which did do it as well uh, but a lot of Japanese cars the temperature sensor will um, falsify the data to the gauge by about one quarter it, it normally reads about one quarter cooler than what the engine is actually running and it's a big issue because these engines are designed to go to three quarters of the way up on the temperature gauge before uh, the cylinder head um, is in danger of cracking or you're in danger of blowing the head gasket. And if your temperature sender or sensor is already old and varnished and it's reading one quarter under what it should be, um, by the time your gauge starts showing three quarters of the way, you're actually needle in the red. You're, you've actually massively overheated the engine. And so because hardly anyone buys an old car like this and replaces that temperature sensor they're pretty much constantly living with incorrect readings and that's where that myth comes from that sort of urban legend about uh, the gauges being so inaccurate by the time it gets to three quarters of the way it's too late even when you have a new sensor like this one um, and your gauge is climbing you got to remember when you're going up a hill and it's going from halfway up to a quarter three quarters of the way up that's not a lot of movement that's like that much tiny amount that is a fine line to be walking because I will tell you now if it gets above three quarters uh, you have cracked the cylinder head it might be a small crack uh, might not appear for a few months until you decide to do another long trip but you have caused significant engine damage so how do you fix these so cars like this one that weren't really designed for Australia uh, but now they live here and you want to be able to drive them. You want to be able to use them whatnot Look the only way to really cool the engine uh, Driving up these steep hills towing doing that sort of stuff is with a radiator This car has two radiators um, It's got a main which sits upright and then there's an auxiliary radiator which sits flat like that What you need to do ideally on a car like this is get a heavy-duty radiator uh, for the main not the auxiliary one that sits flat, uh, the main radiator that sits upright. Because a bigger radiator will hold more coolant, which means that water has more surface area, or antifreeze has more surface area to cool the heat coming out of the engine. Um, usually they have more cores as well, so at least two instead of one, uh, and that basically doubles the cooling ability of the radiator. And usually they're a little bit bigger, they're maybe 48 millimeters uh, instead of 35. Um, don't quote me on that, but I've done this before to cars. I've put in uh, a four core radiator, a three core radiator when I had cooling issues and it solves the issue completely. Um, if you want after that, if you're still having issues, say you're towing two and a half ton and you're carrying eight people, which isn't probably legal, but you're still doing it um, and you're getting warm going up hills, that's when you need to look at getting a 10 blade fan to draw extra air over that bigger radiator. That's when you should look at um, I don't know, getting an aftermarket automatic transmission cooler. 
uh, because not only will it do a great deal of benefit to your gearbox but also take that strain and load off the radiator okay so i hope um that wasn't all over the place i hope that's not confusing um let me just run through a mental checklist in my mind have i covered off the types of heating yes the gauge and the sensor not being accurate which is false it is accurate yes it's calibrated properly yes over time the car is sitting in japan temp gauges get a layer of varnish and oxidation on them i had to replace both the temperature sensors uh, on this 1kz engine the one for the gauge was faulty which i immediately picked up on when i got the car uh, it was actually reading one quarter of the way on the gauge when it was actually at halfway so like i said reading a quarter lower than what it actually is and uh the gearbox wasn't locking up the torque converter so i took it to a couple of gearbox specialists and they told me that my gearbox was wrecked it was ruined i would have ended up four grand out of pocket with those guys and had the same issue and you know what they would have said oh mate it's a it's a japanese import they're just horrible mate they're just bad cars you know horrible we've done everything that we could you know we've rebuilt the gearbox we've put it in blah 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 uh, still having the issue it's got to be some issue with the ecu a uh, uh, car's been flooded at some point in japan they'll come up with any excuse turn out to be a 45 dollar temp sensor because the ecu didn't know that the car was up to running temperature it thought it was running a quarter below so you have the gauge sensor and the ecu temp sensor um after replacing both of them the gearbox started working magically hey hey and uh the temp gauge starts reading properly now hey here's a tip when putting in uh, radiators it doesn't matter if it's factory or alloy or whatnot um, put some sort of rubber mounts or rubber bushings between the radiator mounts don't mount metal on metal uh, with the radiator not for the oxidation effect um, you can ground them out if you want uh, but it's mainly for vibrations if you use a car on rough roads or maybe you see yourself using your car on rough roads uh, driving down corrugated highways things like that dirt roads whatnot your car's bouncing around like crazy that metal on metal can cause metal fatigue and it can actually split the radiator tanks um, if not break the mounts so what I suggest and what I've done previously you're gonna think I'm crazy um, flip-flops they're rubber they're designed to be used in hot harsh extreme environments um, so I cut perfect cylinders out of used flip-flops and use them as sort of rubber dampeners between uh, radiator mounts and it just it changes everything um, the radiator is no longer you know rigidly mounted it is rigidly mounted but all of those vibrations and twisting torsional stresses uh, get absorbed by the rubber flip-flops okay so that's all I have to say about cooling on the 1kz TE I hope it helps I hope it gives you some guidance and hopefully you don't crack your cylinder head which a lot of people do actually can I just say there is a lot of dumb people in this world i'm one of them but there are people even dumber than me so on uh, a recent facebook post uh someone wrote on the 1kz te page or it was a high ace page or something um that their toyota high ace uh has the temperature gauge needle at its maximum in the red with their foot flat to the floor climbing up hills like yo would you not think that hey my car is massively overheating should i not back off a little bit but no this guy was foot flat to his floor climbing up these hills and just completely obliterated his engine um dude why if you're one of those people seriously don't don't pick up a spanner uh just buy like a modern car modern cars are overbuilt no matter where they are um the era of cars like this they would say yeah it'll tow three and a half ton yeah it'll tow two ton uh even if it's sold in australia and you know it's it's laboring to do that and your foot's to the floor the gearbox overheating lights on the engine's running hot everything's running hot nowadays when they design cars like they'll put on the maximum load add 10 percent take it to like the philippines on like the hottest most humid day and climb forest jungles with it all day and night uh just to make sure that it's fine and every sort of generation of car uh, does that r d even better uh, for a while they got the engine sorted the engines weren't overheating no matter what but gearboxes were running really hot um, they added aftermarket coolers in now for the gearboxes not aftermarket factory coolers for the gearboxes now so that's all running really well 
Um, and now they're just refining it, more power, more power, more efficiency, more power. Um, in the days of these things, they did a couple of towing tests with it, and they thought, you know what, no one's really going to be towing with this, 10% of people, that's fine, you know, whatever, they can go to the aftermarket if they, if they blow up their um, transmission. You know, it's just generational changes. You have to know that um, these things, while the bones of the car are really good, the engines are really good, the gearboxes are really good, you have to know, A, how to drive them, and if you take them out of the environment that they were designed for, kind of like taking a lion out of Africa, you wouldn't put him in Alaska, because uh, he'd probably die. Um, you need to make some adjustments uh, to make sure that it can thrive and drive adequately and survive in your environment. Thank you.